Hi everyone, today for our author interview, we are moving a little bit sideways. So previously we've been interviewing horror authors and gothic writers, um, but today it's the first in a series of author interviews in preparation for our conference in November. So our conference in November is called My Poor Devil, and it's going to be about the work of Georgia Heyer. And it is uh, celebrating, in a sense, the centenary of her first novel, The Black Moth. Now, as part of the conference, we're going to be having a roundtable panel called Queering Hair, where we're going to be um, inviting five writers in to talk about the work that they do expanding the world of the Regency and including all of those marginalized communities which hair either excludes or portrays in very problematic ways. So the first of our authors who is going to be joining us for one of these interviews to talk about their work and uh, what they do and how they interact with the Regency um, is Kat Sebastian. And to introduce us to Kat Sebastian, if you're not familiar with her work, she's going to be reading a short passage from one of her novellas for us. And I will hand over to Kat to introduce this passage. Okay. This is from A Little Light Mischief. Okay. Alice must have lost her mind. Here she was not only condoning larceny, but also offering to help. Surely this was wrong. It said so in the Bible. It said so in whatever books they wrote laws in. But try as she might, she couldn't make herself believe that stealing from Mr. Tenpenny was wrong. With his lies, he had ruined her reputation and gotten her cast off by her family. Wasn't the Bible filled with rules about what to do when somebody had stolen one's oxen or chickens or whatnot? Surely having one's life stolen out from under one's feet counted for more than livestock. As for laws, it turned out that she didn't give a fig for them. They were all made up by gentlemen who didn't have to worry about having their lives come undone because one man decided to wave his prick about. He wore a diamond cravat pin at dinner, Alice said. She wanted that cravat pin. She wanted six cravat pins. She wanted to pave a road with cravat pins stolen from lying reprobates. She was an avenging angel. She was justice with her scales. She was going to steal a diamond. That's a start, Molly said, and Alice's heart soared with the thought that there was more that could be stolen more that could be done to set things right. A thousand pounds, Alice said, thinking for the first time of, of the precise cost of her exile, measuring it not in shame and loneliness, but in shillings and pence. Naturally, mere money couldn't make up for the other things she lost, her home, her family, but it was a start. Um, thank you very much. Um, obviously, I know what, what happens next, but it's a great way to even just finish that passage. <laughs> And, you know, for the people at home, it does go well. So don't worry, guys. <laughs> um, so this was a, a shorter novella that was part of one of your larger series. And just to sort of kind of to start the conversation before we go into more of an introduction to your work, I'm interested in this kind of idea of you picking up on these side characters. Is that something that happens quite a lot? Or um, was it some, was hers a story that you'd always wanted to tell? Or was it a story that you couldn't help telling when she'd introduced her? Yeah. It was actually Alice's story that I wanted to tell. Like I had the idea of a woman who, you know, she's been following the rules. She's been doing exactly what she feels that she's supposed to do. And then things go wrong. And it's, there's no way that she can get her life back by following the rules, okay? Like she's effectively been cast out. And then I was thinking like, you know, I have this other character who I really like, and I don't, I, I'm sorry to see who I'm sorry to see go, you know? So I have, I have Molly like as one of the many, I mean like there, I probably have two dozen characters who I wish I could have written a book about, you know, but I just don't have a story for. Her. And I thought like, okay, like these two characters could be paired up in a way that made sense for both of them. Like we know that Molly has no use for like rich people, which Alice kind of used to be, right? She has no use for ladies and gentlemen. And we know that Alice as somebody who's been following, she's, you know, she's a rule follower. She's a people pleaser too. We know that she's not going to take kindly to Molly at first. So we have some tension in there, but their need, there's some synergy in their needs and in their, in the worldview that they're both going to have to adopt in order to get on in the world. I really enjoyed the ending and not to spoil it for people, but um, I mean, something that's particular about your work is that you're often navigating people who are 
um, in this Regency world, um, I'm just thinking about your Regency novels at the moment, but in this Regency world, but navigating a different layer of it than we're used to seeing and also getting a different ending. So um, uh, this is one of the stories where you don't get this kind of Cinderella narrative of moving up and this kind of emphasis on marrying the Duke or marrying the, you know, marrying the Earl um, and sort of Alice becoming uh, moving up a level in society and getting an easy life as a reward for all of her troubles earlier and sort of what's what interested you first of all in writing those stories about the other levels of society and how do you interact with those endings um yeah that's the question yeah and actually I think in this book even though Molly starts out as a lady's maid she's kind of moving down a a rung on the on the ladder right because, because at the end I don't feel like it's totally a spoiler to say that they wind up running a boarding house together okay so Molly goes from not having to do much physical labor at all you know to I mean she's she's working really hard you know she went so but but they both they, this is the way that they get to be together and they get to do what they what they want to do um so like when I started writing, what I really wanted to do was take the Regency as it existed in the books that I had read, okay? Like we're talking like the rich people, the balls, the whole thing, but I wanted I wanted to have queer relationships. And I figured out about halfway into my first, the, the first draft of my first book that I, I couldn't do it, okay? Like in order for me to create happy endings that worked for me as a writer, and that were the kind of story I wanted to tell, I couldn't just stick queer people into the setting that I like. I couldn't just do the, the same set pieces, the same tropes. I had to, I had to challenge the idea that, you know, romance as we're used to it, it's, it restores order, right? Like that happens, I mean, in, in Hair, like that's all of her books do that, right? They take the existing order of things and they, um, prop it up like the aristocrat the like the waifs and highwaymen are always revealed to be like you know um either a duke or the daughter of a duke right like that's how it that's how it works out and I realized that like once you once you like have characters who have to say to themselves like like who I am is a secret you know it, like the you know and the relationship that I have must be a secret and possibly will get me killed okay like once you have characters who are saying that you also have to challenge the order of things. You have to have a happy ending that has the characters call the existing order of things into question. Okay. So you have to, so like, I can't have them be, I can't have them be like happy and rich at the end of, I think I might've done that in one book. Okay. But even that I, I, and that would have been the rune of a rake, I think, but like, you can't have, you can't have characters I can't have them accept that the order of things is okay. All right. Like, and once you start saying that, well, like just because, just because everybody, just because like my relationship is, is, um, is like illegal and like, and like everybody would think it was shameful. I can't have them, I, they have to also interrogate the other things, the other injustices in the world. Like what other things are maybe, maybe, maybe poverty also needs to be called into question you know, maybe incarceration needs to be called into question and like obviously this mirrors the things that we're all thinking in the present day right like if we have some injustices that we allow to happen like does that mean that the like how much of the existing order of things is even worth keeping you know anyway that was word salad but it just is that is I feel like I want to write about characters who are thinking about that and I think that shapes their happy ending yeah, I mean, I also, I find the happy endings a lot more satisfying because they look like, they look real, optimistic, sometimes utopian, but real, like, you know, it's lucky in a sense that Alice gets what she wants and is able to obtain the money that she needs. Um, but that sense of like, okay, well, the way we get to be together is through hard work, but that means that we get to be independent and we get to live a life that we want that felt, that feels kind of attainable. Oh. Yeah, it's like, a, it's a thing that people, it's a thing that people did. Like people ran boarding houses, that, that's, you know what I mean? Like, and it's a way that two women could be together without having to worry too much about secrecy. It's a way that they could, they could raise a child because that's part of their situation. 
you know, and that, yeah, no, that's when I'm writing, that's something that, like, like you said, there's always like, I am writing about the lucky people, right? Like the people who like do just have a gamekeeper's cottage that they can like happen to run away to, right? But I don't also want, but, but they're, but they're not going to be able to like, okay, like they're not going to profit off of the labor of other people too much, you know, like that, that really rubs me the wrong way. And I think that it rubs a lot of my readers the wrong way. And I think that's part of why, I think that's part of like what, what we're, we're looking at when we're talking about a satisfying ending, right? That we're, we don't have the sense of there being like, you know, we, we know that like wealth today and wealth 200 years ago, it like, comes from exploited people, right? So you want to you want to minimize that as much as possible if you're writing an writing for an audience, but also is thinking that exact same thought, you know? Yeah. I mean, another thing that you're sort of engaging in the history and some of the history that is difficult to confront and a lot of people quite often don't want to confront within the Regency, that sort of not necessarily hidden history, but occluded histories of things like uh, slavery, obviously, and race and race relations at the time, um, beyond slavery as well, sort of the the, uh, the free black population in England at the time, um, the queer people, class. Um, I mean, this uh, is not to suggest in any way that people writing a different type of Regency novel are not doing extensive research, but uh, because they are. But there is also a sense to some extent that that kind of Regency world of balls on the upper, upper echelons that includes those difficult histories is, it exists already, there's maps for it um, in the work of somebody as influential as Hare, for example. But how did you get started in sort of both researching and writing those difficult occluded histories? So a lot of the a lot of the story of the story is that the occluded histories are often there. Okay, like they're like the other the other histories can exist without without like the underpinning of all of these other secret histories, and so you just have to like look really carefully. Also, like you know, I'm like not the first person in the world to be like I am curious about like what black people were doing and like in in George and London. You know, like I have like back there a shelf of a couple of books, you know, and so that helps like once you see like okay, you know, like this is what like this is how disabled people live. Like this is this is what a community of black people in like 1830 in London looked like. You know, once you have that, you can sort of say like okay, like these are the parameters that I'm working with, okay? And then you can and then you can like build from there. Like I'm not like I'm not looking to recreate like the something that's like perfectly historically accurate. Okay, like, I probably shouldn't admit that. Okay, I'm looking to create something that's historically resonant for a reader in the present day. Okay, so if I can find these stories of people who were living the kind of life that my characters are then I can sort of like use those as plot bunnies and go from there. Yeah. I mean, there's so much, there's so much research and work out there that it's, it's there for the picking. It's there for the taking. Um, and it's fun too, because it's like, you know, it's like you get to learn about people who had jobs that maybe you don't, you know, like I have for, I wrote one of my books that takes place in a, um, in a printers, okay? And so it turns out that you know, voluminous amounts of research have been done on like what life what life was like for printers, you know, in the in the Regency and in the you know in the Georgian era, like right the whole long 18th century. Because like it was this was like it was a really fast moving industry. And and so like there's all of this research and it's so fun to look at like the all of the like the gossip like this this one hated that one and like you can like there's so much to work with there oh the engravers oh and they hated one another and this one wouldn't go to dinner with that one like it's wonderful like you have to stop yourself from researching and be like okay like i'm not writing about like feuding engravers i'm not doing that that's somebody else's book i'm you know then and then you can get back on track yeah i mean that's always there's so many assumptions that I bring to the Regency sometimes, even as an 18th century scholar, because of the reading and the, the watching that I've done growing up. Um, you know, assumptions like, well, women weren't involved in the print industry. And then you realize that actually some of the major 
major printers and major publishers were women or run by women or owned by women. And, you know, there's a whole industry of women writers and so on and so forth. So there's these kind of just adventures that you go on with research. What was, what's been one of your, or one of, or perhaps your most favorite kind of research wormhole that you fell into? <laughs> oh, the printers were a big one. Like I wound up, I wound up like half convinced that I was going to write about, um, that I was going to write like a series about printers. And I had, I had to just like, I had to stop. Like I was wait, it was going to wind up being like very like tedious and fact laden. It looks, I was really into it. Okay. But, but so I had to just like put those, those books like on a high shelf. So, I, so I couldn't get too, so I couldn't get too involved. I also like, sometimes when I, what I'll do is I'll read, I'll start reading nonfiction in a period a period that I have nothing to do with, okay? And then I'm utterly ignorant about, okay? Like the Middle Ages, like I am, I am like a tiny baby. I don't know anything about it, okay? However, if I'm reading like a really good narrative history, I will convince myself that I am, I'm a scholar. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and so <laughs> I had read that, that book that was popular. Oh, I can't think of the author, but it's the Plantagenes, okay? And it's like, oh, it's like a hefty book and it goes into this minute detail and it's fantastic because it's like the most, it's like history told in like the most soap opera like type of way, like, oh, it's fantastic. And like, and, um, and I was like, I could definitely, I was like, I could definitely write a Plantagenet romance. Like this is, this is what the world needs. Like, no, the, the world might need it, but it, need, it doesn't need to come from me because I would have them, I would have them like writing, writing around in like, <laughs> Like hackney cabs, you know. Like I would, I would just tell, sending ten telegrams to one another. Like it would not be good. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you you are writing in other eras as well now. Like obviously, um, one of my favorites is Heather Page, which is in the nineteen forties, I think. And you're writing in the nineteen fifties in American series, is that right? Yeah. So, what kind of made you branch out a little bit, both forwards and backwards? The, the um, Heather Page, that universe is totally just because I had, I had read, I read a lot of mysteries, okay? And you have like, you know, you have Agatha Christie, obviously, and you have the other like golden age mystery writers. Then you have, have like so many mysteries that are written in the present day, but are set back then. And they tend to follow the conventions set by Agatha Christie. So you have like, you know, like the quaint little village and um, and like not everyone is who they seem, but they also, because they're in the tradition, of, it's the same thing that we see in romance, right? Where like you have like, hey, or who, who casts the mold and then other people just just follow that because it's like, you know, there's an odd, there's already an audience there. And also it's charming. And so like that's, so you're inspired to like write more in this charming universe. So the same thing happens with mystery. So you wind up with this, like, with like a lot of books that are like really heteronormative and classist and like, you know, like the disabled people are like secretly, or like secretly, it's not good. It's not good. Like we all know, we all know the, 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 the tropes that Agatha Christie used and like it wasn't great um and they wind up duplicated and so I had been I guess it was in like 2017 okay or so I had been like binge reading mysteries like that even more than usual and I wound up convincing myself like I will like I will write a gay version of this like this is what I will do you know how hard can it be you know like because I have read 10 million mysteries right like how hard can it be to do this the answer is that it was actually really really hard like I like my first many many drafts like did not have the murder solved okay and um but but um I really I just really wanted to I wanted to write to write something in that type of universe, but that addressed the problems that had been sort of like, like, you know, like eating away at my own enjoyment of them. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, also, this is a, a very self-indulgent question, but my favorite characters in literally your entire output, Akora and Edith, have a very small yeah. role in that book. Yeah. Um, and are they getting their own story? <laughs> they are, they are. It's one of them, it's, it's like, so right now I'm writing the second, I'm finished. It's mainly finished. Okay. Like the, it is the most cursed project that I've ever, I've ever attempted. It's the sequel to Hither Page. Okay. It's mainly done. And after that, 
I'm reading the Cora and Edith prequel. Cora and Edith do appear briefly in the sequel to Hither Page, which doesn't have a title yet, just to give you an idea of like how cursed this project has been. It's been like, I, I was supposed to have it done like over a year ago, but whatever, you know, <laughs> here we are. But yeah, that's, I just wanted to, I, sometimes when I, when I am, um, as for the like the six the 19, late fifties early sixties American I don't even know how that started like that was just I wanted to I was in between books and I just wanted I had a story that was in my head and I was like I'm just gonna write it and I sat down and I was like I just hammered out that novella in about a week and I loved it and then the second one was the similar situation where I was supposed to be writing about like gay highwaymen and it was the first couple of weeks of of um, lockdown and I could not like it was just like I could not write anything with plot or anything like that there could not be anything intricate in what I was writing. It needed to be like all feelings, just vibes. And so um and so I wrote about a I wrote a road trip and there's no plot at all other than they get in the car and they eat pancakes and whatever. Like that's the whole story with like some 1960 Route 66 energy. Like yeah. I mean, talking of no plot or vibes, <laughs> is it, which one, oh my gosh, which, what, what's the name of it? The, the third in the series of the brothers, the- um, Two rogues make a right. Two rogues make a right. No plot, all. That's, that is no plot, just vibes, yep. <laughs> yeah. Was that sort of, was that a pandemic book or not? That was before, I think, wasn't it? That was before the pandemic and it was just total synergy that it came out when no plot, just vibes was like all anybody could handle. <laughs> definitely all I could handle I was just sort of laid there crying <laughs> but I think um the queer principles of quick kit web is out this month is that right and is that set back in time a little bit so the 18th century how did you find that shift into moving back into a slightly earlier period and did you find it quite distinct from the regency work or so it felt distinct to me writing it. I don't know how distinct it's going to feel to readers. Like the idea was to come up with a time period that wouldn't be alienating to readers who had written, like who had read like 11 books of mine that were set in the Regency. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want to like just completely throw something, something like foreign and strange. I didn't want the barrier to entry to be too high. Okay. But at the same time, I could not write another region to like, I was gonna die, okay? And so, and I don't even know why, like my editor was asking like, what is it exactly? I was like, I don't know, like, I, I don't know I, if I could, I, I could go to therapy for like two years and talk about this, or I could just pick a different setting. And so we just picked a different setting. Yeah. Um, and the idea was to go far back enough so that it felt like it had a different mood. So it was just different enough for me to like, have something to sink my teeth into. And 1750 felt early enough. You know, um, and but all but still, like it's it's um. You have you have, you have like the roads are really bad. Like I, I keep harping on this, but like that makes such a big difference. Like in terms of, in the Regency, you have like you have stagecoaches. Like you don't have trains, but you can still get from point A to point B as long as it's like city to city without it being too much of it. Too much of there's no suspense in whether you're gonna make it. You know. Um, you go back to 1750 and the roads are garbage it's wonderful you know like so if you're a highwayman okay like this is um like this is good also i, ne I needed for um highwaymen to be more plausible okay like there were highwaymen like as as late as the regency but i needed i wanted the like the, the ground to be thick with highwaymen okay <laughs> that's that's what i but i didn't want to go as far back as the english civil war that wasn't going to work also because I don't know anything about the English Civil War. So like that would have been, that would have been unfortunate. <laughs> I still have my fingers crossed for the Restoration Court. You know, no, I know. But that's like, that's like, that would be, we'd be stretching my knowledge like to the utmost with that. But I know, I, I really want somebody to write like a, a good queer restoration. Give me a trilogy, make it really plotty. I want like apothecaries, you know? It's, I, there's so much, there and it was such a queer kind of period of history as well it's like yes I guess. somebody make it for me <laughs> I'm also one of my uh I know that you've been working with um sort of different forms of uh religion so one of the things that I'm really interested in obviously yes. very niche yes yes 
is that depiction of kind of religious practice as well and how that impacted life. So I, I know that you, you switched it up a little bit, but how have you been going into that more? Is it something that you'll include again, do you think, kind of these dissenting groups with these sometimes just really fascinating or bizarre histories sometimes as well? I love, I mean, like I, I was raised Catholic, but I managed to have like no negative feelings about it at all. You know what I mean? Like I, I was raised by like secular Catholics, I guess is the best way to put it. Okay. And I'm just absolutely nothing right now. And so I, I'm just like, I approach religion with like wide eyed fascination because like, it's just not something that I ever really had. Um, and so I love, I love the idea that like people, that like people were that there also were people in the past who were culturally, who were, who like Quakerism was there. They were also perhaps like secularly involved in whatever religion, just, just because it was, the, that's just what you did on Sunday or that's just the way you were raised. I am, um, I like that. I also really like, I also, I mean, this is going to sound like religion tourism, but I like the idea of there are people who, have a thing that they believe in like that just is as someone who doesn't have that that is like really interesting to me you know like imagine that like having a like having a like a a code of a code of like how to how to live that you can sort of consult you know um but also like since since the regency in particular Regency fiction is often filled with like vicars and whatever. It seemed like when I was writing the vicar character, it seemed like like how odd that like you know we don't have more like that we don't have more vicars and I can write a, a gay vicar and like then that'll be wonderful. So. <laughs> I think it's a really interesting way as well of uh, what well, we've talked about, kind of widening that that world out away from kind of the Harian, like the restrictions of the Harian yeah. model. And I think like one of the things that doesn't get talked about as much with her is the way in which her religious landscape is nothing like the Regency period at all. Yeah. Yeah. And it's completely informed by her own kind of time period. And I think that kind of switch to actually looking at or in, interrogating what kind of re the religious, religious kind of landscape was like in the period is also one of, one of the ways of deconstructing that particular world and also deconstructing this idea we often have of like everything was very hegemonic and everybody believed the same thing and everybody was just going to church on a Sunday where it's actually, you know, there's whole wars going on <laughs> about really tiny points, but you've yeah. also got that spectrum of, you know, uh, Quakers are a really good example of, of groups that were resisting many of the kind of uh, normal values and practices you know of the period yeah I am um, when I was writing the Quaker character and I was researching the like the entire like they had the entire like culture of like the secular aspects like the non-religious aspects of Quaker Quaker culture mainly in the UK because in the US it was like a different energy altogether like it was much more um like there was apparently a split, which you probably know more about than I do. But like in the UK, you have like, you have people who, who like were writing their own versions of like the fairy, the stories that I, I had the mother, okay, of one of the characters be like a radical, like a radical activist Quaker, okay. And um, I had to, I had to send her off to America because she kept interfering. Like, I loved her so much. Like she was like, she's one of the, she's like, I had to absolutely take her off stage completely because she was like, I love the idea that like there was a religion where women had actual, like had actual power and like, I just couldn't get over it. But yes, that's something that you're not gonna, like, you're not gonna find that in hair. You're not gonna find it in, in like any of the, cause it, it's not something that you even saw I mean, like, it's not even that, in most religions, you don't even see much of it today, you know? No, I think it's a really, for me, it's a really interesting, a really interesting lens to kind of reass reassess the period. And a lot of those kind of claims, well, everybody was doing it. I'm like, well, look at the Quakers. Right. <laughs> they were not. Right. So <laughs> let's, let's reassess, guys. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's obviously, it's my pet, pet thing that I love. So I'm glad that you're 
exploring that world a little bit. Um, just for people who have not kind of read much of your work, I believe that second question. <laughs> like, um, could you sort of give an introduction to just some of your major series, perhaps, because you've got some standalones, but you've also got these these uh, these series. Yes, um, the Turner series is um, it is basically about the Turner family, but not entirely about the Turner. There's, there's one book that totally, two books that totally aren't. Um, basically, it's like very trope heavy Regency. Um, that's my first series. And it's like the most informed by like me taking like, a, like me trying to like subvert what I thought was a like a classic romance plot or setup. Okay. Um, the Cedrics is three brothers and that's that whole series is very much like low plot high high vibes um <laughs> and um the imposters is non-mm queer regencies in which look like calling it imposters is probably a bit of a stretch like okay but like every, the characters each have like a secret okay and there is like, again, there's not, there's like a, there's like a little bit of plot in those books. Like there's, you know, um, and those are like my, those are my three main series. And then my new release is um, The Queer Principles of Kit Webb. And it is also part of a series that does not have a title and will have either two or probably three books. So yeah and that that is like and that's georgian highwaymen capes boots high heeled shoes wigs you know like that's yeah i mean the that fashion at least is so much more fun in the 18th I know. century i know like the whole like when i was supposed to be pitching the book i was like telling my editor i was like al 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 high heeled shoes <laughs> you know like that was and she was like yes <laughs> It's so, the it's so good like it's just it's it's so it's all like it's if you want to write up about people like swishing around like in capes and satin and like the clouds of powder you know and little velvet patches like oh you just can't do any better you know I loved it I don't really know if I'm allowed to ask this so feel okay. free to say stop <laughs> is there a favorite perhaps story or perhaps character that you is kind of the cl particularly close to your heart? Or you, could, you might not be able to say. I mean, like it, it changes, honestly. Okay, like most days I'm going to say um, Rune of a Rake. Okay, just because it was, it was one of those books that just it came together like, and it's, the way it is print the way it is is like pretty much the way I envisioned it like it just happened and I loved those characters and they existed like fully formed in my mind before I wrote the book which never happened so it was a delight to write you know um in terms of but honestly like in terms of the books that the characters have like lasting that I that I have like a really soft spot for it is like it's the two robes it's those idiots like they you know um yeah and also the Tommy Cabot was here like that the 1959 America set novella like that's another one where it just all came together so well and it's just energy and crying and um and sweaters like yes. yeah the perfect combo yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean I think like two rogues two rogues for me is one that I I can't read a lot because I need to like just clear my schedule <laughs> like lolling and weeping <laughs> not that it's a sad book everybody if you're wondering it's just like there's so many like feelings and they're so cute and they're so they're such muppets <laughs> they are muppets they are yeah they're not good at thinking you know like they're, <laughs> they're not good at feeling or thinking they're just doing their best and it's not good it's not good <laughs> I think probably the funniest sex scene I've ever read like, was one of my one of my favorites. Is it the Mall Flanders one? Is it the Mall Flanders sex scene? I can't remember. Or... It's the one 
it's the one where they start maybe they do it in every scene but the one where they start <laughs> meeting each other halfway through <laughs> um <laughs> but it's, it's the bickering like the bicker like the yes. like, yeah. yeah yeah that one yeah bickering the bicker sex is like yeah yeah there's a lot in that book because <laughs> <laughs> i mean it, they're such you know such long friends and such good friends that it i don't know there's just a really comfortable vibe to it and you kind of i'm like okay right i'm reading it like, nope I'm, I'm listening to an argument <laughs> that's what's happening now um or bicker um, so thank you so much for talking to us. I'll, I'm going to segue into the last section, which is our standard questions. But if you're following this series, which I know some people are, um, we're not going to be asking about horror, <laughs> obviously, guys. Um, to, I mean, although you can feel free to answer in a horror related way, Kat, if you like. But the first question is, um, what was the book that got you into, and let's say book or author more generally, um, that got you into romance and or regency writing particularly perhaps what got me into reading it was hair okay like it's and i can't remember exactly how that happened other than it must have been and i think that i think it was like an app like an amazon suggestion or something okay like like just like total like and um and i wound up reading venetia and frederica in like a single like 48 hour like orgy of of like regency bliss and um and like my at that point like my kids were, were like little babies and my brain was fried and like I couldn't handle anything that wasn't really happy okay and like hair delivers especially Frederica that was like like the amount of serotonin in my brain which I did there wasn't any okay so I can't say it doubled but like I had serotonin at the end of it which was like and so of course like now I'm chasing the high right like at that point I have to read everything she wrote and then when I finished that I moved straight into um like the Julia Julia Quinn and Eloise James and Lisa Kleypas like and it was just like there was there was it was just like a cart rolling downhill after that and then you get to the point where like well when you have you know like when you have a hobby you're like I will monetize it and then, you know, like who hasn't had the idea? Like I'm gonna go write a book or whatever. So I wrote like part, several, I started several really bad books that we can all be really glad that I didn't finish them. And then um, I got mad about there not being enough like gay and disabled people. And then I wrote, I wrote um, The Soldier Scoundrel just out of peak and irritation, you know, so. The best of all motivators. <laughs> And, of, and like later on, I realized that there actually was quite a bit of like gay regency out there. And I just didn't know how to find it, but whatever. I, I mean, I think that's so often the case with queer books is you're kind of like, you feel like you're wandering around in a complete desert. And then once you kind of pull a thread and Amazon's like, oh, do you like gay things? <laughs> you're like, oh, now I see. <laughs> um, although Twitter's probably the best thing for that I feel like I found so many authors and books through strategic following on Twitter mm -hmm. yeah totally totally um a second question is who are some writers that you think have sort of particularly influenced you um and this might be kind of in both ways uh you know sort of somebody like hair we know kind of it's some it's an author that gets a lot of people into the regency but also an author that a lot of people kind of want to move beyond in their own regency worlds. Um, but yeah, so who are some people who I know inspired, that's the wrong word, but you know what I mean, kind of influence. Yeah. I mean, influence in the good way, right? Um, I have been reading, like, okay, so Courtney Milan and uh, was it right at the time was writing and still is writing books that have like the least amount of plot that you can you, that you can have to sustain a book okay like that was like hugely important for me to see and also people behave decently to one another people are fundamentally decent there's not a lot of um like big misunderstandings or that kind of thing like that was like and I was like oh my like that is some that's some I could do that like that's something which also like also like I'm well aware of like the hubris of like baby writer me being reading Courtney Milan and going like I could do that you know what I mean? Like, but like, that's the, you know, like, but like just to see that it could be done was important. And also Rose Lerner, because I was, I was reading and continue to read quite a lot of Rose Lerner and to see that you don't have to have like rich people as the focus. Okay. And Cecilia Grant too, like, you don't have to have rich people as the focus. Like, even if you're writing about 
like landed gentry rich people don't have to be the focus like that was that was like when you're coming from hair and then then like the the most popular regency titles that is like it it sounds obvious but like it really wasn't you know that like you can actually write happy endings for other classes of people and that was something I needed to see before I could write I think like I, I might have said this to you before but I was kind of I grew up reading on one hand hair and those worlds where like poor people were just there to be decorative in the background helpful and servile at various points or to be like no good crooks of course yeah obviously. <laughs> yes of course <laughs> terrible people <laughs> um and then I was also reading Catherine Cookson where everybody's poor and, and rich people are always evil <laughs> <laughs> so I had a bit of balance <laughs> but I didn't really have an in-between <laughs> um yeah. <laughs> but yeah I feel like uh when people when people say oh, I've never seen poor people in I'm like oh we've got this whole like genre but it's more Victorian I guess and not as many people know it which is really sad to me because I love those stories of like I, poor people <laughs> that's like I, I could be mistaken okay but I feel like that's not a, like a subgenre of like romance slash historical fiction that crossed the Atlantic. Okay, like I know who Catherine Cookson is, but I've never read it. You know what I mean? Like I don't feel like I can go into my library or bookstore and find Catherine Cookson. Of course, like as I'm, I'm going to now go look and I'm going to be proven wrong. There's going to be like 12 shelves of Catherine Cookson at my library. But like, I don't feel like, I don't feel like that particular like coal miners in love is like as much of a thing in the US. No, I think like from, speaking to a lot of my romance reading friends in America like I've introduced them to like Catherine Cookson through the tv series and you know you pick you have to pick and choose I would say with Catherine Cookson quite carefully but um you know I've introduced them through that and they've really enjoyed it but they've never kind of come across her or any of that kind of uh writer before which is sad to me but great that I get to introduce people because I love doing that <laughs> Um, and then making them watch them with me. So I have an excuse to watch them again, <laughs> the adaptations. Um, the last question, and this is kind of, it's a good segue if I'd done the segue well, um, is tell me, or can you tell me um, five sort of films or TV series or a media of your choice that you think give a good insight into your tastes? Hmm. Okay, first of all, I almost never get to watch any television unless it is with my kids, okay? And now that they're older, like my oldest is 13, okay? I can make them watch almost anything and it's okay. Like I'm not a bad parent, <laughs> you know? But but like for a while, for a while, like Shira was the most daring I could watch. <laughs> um, and also watching television with little kids is very much like, you get to watch 15 minutes, yeah. you know, and then there's a crisis. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to give you five things I've enjoyed in the last like year. Okay. Okay. I love Ted Lasso. Okay. I adored it. Um, like it made me so happy. Uh, I, we watched The Good Place. I enjoyed it. Um, I watched the 1996 Pride and Prejudice with my daughter who routinely paused the, she's 11, okay? And she's the smartest person I know. She was like, everyone in this, everyone in this story bullies Darcy, okay? And now I can never like unhear that. That has totally like reframed my understanding of Pride and Prejudice, especially that particular version where people actually do, like they, like Elizabeth in that version, like ruthlessly mocks Darcy, which is like, so, which is, yes, that is so charming. Like that is, I love it. Okay. Um, and what else did we watch? Oh, Little Women, the, um, the new Little Women. I adored it. Yeah. So that's like a totally dis that prob honestly I probably gave you like a better insight into my daughter's taste in television than I did mine, but I enjoyed all of those. Yeah, that's good. I reckon. I yeah. mean, if somebody asked me to come up with five things I'd enjoyed this year, it would be a sort of a hideous reveal <laughs> of my yeah. terrible taste in TV. I mean, there's years. that too. Like, there's that too. Like, there's the fact that I've like there are certain audiobooks that I've listened to like 
50 times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's I the think that, like I've I like the other day I was like, I can't listen to music anymore. Like it's like my mood is like not like I'm not I'm like not emotionally stable enough to listen to like music. Like as a concept, like I can't do it anymore. Yeah. I mean I find that, but that's because I listen to almost entirely really sad folk music. Yeah, of course. <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you so much, uh, Kat, for joining us. Um, and thank I will you. close our interview just with a thank you. And for people to um, find your books and find your work. Uh, what's your website? Is it katsebastian.com? nice and easy and i'll pop that in the the links below as well guys so that you can find it easily so thank you very much thank you